Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Welcome to the NASA Earth Data Webinar, Metadata Recommendations, Dialects, Evaluation, and Improvement. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. I've got 2 o'clock Eastern Time, so we are going to go ahead and get started here. We do appreciate your feedback, by the way, on the two optional polls at the bottom left and middle portion of the page, so thank you for your participation there. What I'd like to do first is begin by going over a few housekeeping items related to this webinar. The first is to ensure best audio experience, the conference has been placed in silent mode. So if you have any issues or you have any questions, what I'd like for you to do is to enter those into the Q&A pod at the bottom, located on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Okay, this works like a chat. The webinar itself is being recorded and it will be posted to both our NASA Online Adobe Connect event catalog, as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a few days of completion. These URLs will be provided to you at the end. All presentation files will also be available for download at the end of the webinar. As far as timing is concerned, this webinar is one hour long. We've allocated 45 minutes to the presentation with another 15 minutes for the Q&A period. After our speaker has finished his presentation, what we'll do next is we'll move to the final set of polling questions. As mentioned earlier, you will have an opportunity to ask your questions throughout by using the Q&A pod. Questions will not be answered using the raising hand function. It has been disabled. Again, we'll take all questions using the Q&A pod at the end. So now we will move to our agenda for today. During this webinar, our speaker will begin by providing an introduction to the Big Earth Data Initiative, or BETI project, and also related projects. Next, he will discuss metadata recommendations and dialects, metadata comparison tools, metadata evaluations, and finally, finish up with metadata evaluation results and a guidance page information. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Ted Haber who is the Director of Earth Science at the HDF Group. Ted? <clears throat> okay, sorry about that. A little misunderstanding with my phone. Uh, thank you very much, Jennifer, and thank you to everybody. I, I agree uh, with Jennifer 100%. We're happy to get the uh, the feedback on the polling questions, and I'd love it to uh, we continue that after the talk. Interesting information. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Um, this is the I'm reporting today on uh, some work that we've been doing as part of Betty uh, metadata recommendations, dialects, evaluation, and improvement. Some of you have heard. Uh, some elements of this before. I hope that I hope that it's uh, clarified for you, and I hope that uh, new people enjoy it as well. <clears throat> uh, as Jennifer mentioned, this is part of the Big Earth Data Initiative, uh, the Betty Project, uh, and Betty is in, in investing in standardizing and optimizing collection management and delivery of U.S. government civil Earth observations. Uh, to improve discovery, access, use, and understanding of these observations by the broader community. And uh, uh, metadata is a uh, complete and consistent standard metadata. <clears throat> uh, helps address all three of these goals, and that's primarily uh, the goal of our work, is to help improve consistency and completeness of metadata. <clears throat> Another nice thing about Betty is that it's uh, included by all of the agencies that are in uh, USGO. So this work is um, supported by NASA, and um, we've done a little. We'll have some. We have some results with NASA metadata and some uh, results for USGS metadata. But we're actually happy to work with uh, any of these uh, other agencies, and our our approaches are very general. Um, in this pro in this project, uh, the bigger data initiative. Uh, we were working with several different communities. I just mentioned a number of agencies, NASA, NOAA, USGS, USDA, uh, EPA, and others that are part of USGO. And I'll, I'll define in a minute a term that I use called dialects, uh, which are metadata dialects that are used by uh, these communities. In this case, we're using uh, 
GIF and ECHO, uh, two classic uh, NASA uh, dialects for metadata. ISO is, uh, every, most people are familiar with ISO. Uh, the FGDC dialect, which is actually CSDGM, and EML, um, which is part of uh, the ecology metadata language. We're fortunate to be working on a number of different projects that are related to this, uh, funded by NSF uh, and NASA. Uh, a data infrastructure building block project working with uh, primarily right now Data One, but in the near future other communities. <clears throat> um, uh, metadata evolution for the NASA data systems. The MENS project is sort of percolating along. Um, that's working with the uh, mostly the NASA DAX and the, the Common Metadata Repository. And then another NSF project on Arctic research, uh, Arctic research mapping application, working with the Alaska Data Integration Working Group, uh, NSIDC, and NASA. And all of these, all of these different communities have uh, existing metadata that they're uh, interested in trying to evaluate and improve, and, and that metadata exists in a lot of different dialects. So all of these projects are, are informing one another, and hopefully we're moving them all forward together. Terminology, a couple of things. A concept is a general term for describing a document entity, documentation entity. These are very conceptual things, titles, revision date, process steps, spatial extent. Most of us, most of you in this in this webinar are familiar with the idea of content standards. Um, for instance, the FGDC uh, content standard or the ISO 19115. So these concepts are things that are in those content standards. They define concepts that, that should uh, or can show up in metadata. Um, <clears throat> dialects are a particular form of the documentation language that's specific to a community. Uh, many of us call these things standards. <clears throat> um, I try and use the word dialect to uh, emphasize similarities between these things, um, whereas sometimes uh, the term standard seems to somehow become to uh, uh, focus on differences between these things. So directory interchange format, uh, content standard for digital geospatial metadata, ecology metadata language, and ECHO um, as this clearinghouse. All of these are, are dialects. We'll talk about those quite a bit. Uh, recommendations are sets of concepts that a group or organization believes is required for achieving a documentation goal. There are many um, uh, metadata recommendations that are out there, and we'll show some examples of those. We'll hear quite a bit about them. Spirals are similar to recommendations. They're also sets of concepts, but instead of coming from an organization or a group, it's a set of concepts that's required to support a particular documentation need or use case. So both recommendations or spirals are, are, are sets of concepts, but they have different origins. In one case, uh, an organization is making a recommendation. In other cases, uh, a metadata provider is trying to address a particular need or a use case. Finally, a collection is a, a metadata collection. It's a group of metadata records. Could come from a, a data center or an organization or a project or a collection uh, sites or something like that. Um, so uh, collection is just a general term for uh, sets of metadata records. So recommendations and dialects. Uh, I've, I've been trying to explain this concept, and it's a little bit complicated, so I, I thought I would return to uh, the playground analogy <clears throat> and also the analogy of setting a bar. So this is a bar, and it's a, it's a recommendation. It's a, the, the, the blue colored things are all of the concepts that are, uh, or represent the concepts that are in the recommendation. And the recommendation is conceptual, and um, so it's sort of perfect. So if we make a recommendation uh, and, and, and a, a group or a met, some metadata records follow that recommendation completely, then that would be a perfect metadata record with respect to that uh, recommendation. Um, in a lot of cases, because we're dealing with dialects and recommendations separately, um, dialects don't actually include all of the elements that are in a recommendation. So when we compare a recommendation to a dialect, the dialects are implementations. They're usually in XML. Recommendations are many times in PDFs or documents. <laughs> Excuse me. 
Most of the ones that we're dealing with are implemented in uh, XML. <clears throat> and in many cases, the dialects don't have all of the concepts that are in a recommendation. So we have a number called the dialect maximum, which is the number of concepts from a recommendation included in the dialect. <clears throat> and this is important because organizations typically create metadata in some dialect, and then they become interested in some recommendation at some time in the future. Uh, and that recommendation may have concepts that aren't included in the dialect, uh, and it's important to understand what those are. The final step, of course, is, is actual reality, uh, real-world metadata records. And um, in some cases, metadata records are complete uh, with respect, or as complete as they can be in, in a certain dialect with respect to a recommendation. In many cases, they're not, and that's what we're uh, interested in improving. Um, so there's also missing elements. So I'll try to be consistent when I'm talking about missing concepts and, and missing elements. And uh, if, if I say something that doesn't make sense, remember that concepts are, are parts of a recommendation that are missing from a dialect. And, and elements, missing elements, are elements in, the, in XML that are missing, um, uh, XML elements that are missing. Okay. Hopefully that's clear. Uh, we also have scores for metadata uh, records because we're interested in quantitative evaluations. <clears throat> and the scores are the number of elements that are missing from a metadata record. So those are, those are a couple important numbers, and hopefully we understand this concept. Unfortunately, it gets a little bit more complicated because many organizations have a recommendation that's coming in externally, but they have multiple dialects inside of the organization. So this could be like in the NASA case, we have directory interchange or GIF uh, records. We also have echo records. Or in other situations, we might have different versions. For instance, of ecology metadata language has a few different versions that are out there. Or an organization might have some FGDC records and some ISO records. Uh, they might be in the, in the process of, of migrating from FGDC to ISO. So it's very typical for organizations to have metadata in multiple dialects. And then they, of course, have multiple collections of metadata. And in that case, <clears throat> we have each of those dialects has missing concepts and missing elements with respect to a, a single um, recommendation. So we were, we're dealing in multi-dialect worlds. Uh, once again, the definition of recommendations, a set of concepts that a group believes are required for achieving a documentation goal. So this is a, a screenshot of a, a a, a document generated by GCMD, uh, the Global Change Master Directory, which I'm sure you're, uh, many of you are familiar with. Um, and the important thing about this picture is there are, you can see two different um, kinds of, two different colors of text. And if we looked at uh, the next page of this document, we'd actually see three different colors of text. And those colors of text um, correspond to different levels of the recommendation. Maybe you can read um, <clears throat> uh, in, the, in the paragraph above, the orange ones are required, the mustard colored ones are highly recommended, and on the next page there are green ones that are recommended. So it's very typical for recommendations to have multiple levels. And usually the highest level, like the required or mandatory level, tends to be small because, of course, we want to uh, minimize uh, what people have to do to, uh, to get metadata into the system. But anyway, so we're very familiar with recommendations on multiple levels. <clears throat> uh, the same approach was used in the Attribute Convention for Data Discovery uh, that some, some of you are probably familiar with. It was created a while ago by uh, Ethan Davis at Unidata and picked up um, by uh, the metadata group that I used to work with at NOAA and then uh, also now managed by uh, the documentation cluster at ESIP. Uh, the Attribute Convention for Data Discovery also had multiple levels, uh, happened to be highly recommended, uh, recommended and uh, suggested, I think. <clears throat> uh, finally, in ISO 19115 that came out in 2003, uh, there was a set of things called core uh, metadata um, 
actually this is from 19115-1, where we, we wrote down some things about discovery metadata, and there were mandatory and optional fields there as well. So in the real world, our, our playground actually has multiple levels. Recommendations have multiple levels with names like required, recommended, and suggested. Um, each of those has uh, missing concepts uh, that depend on a particular dialect, and, um, and the metadata has different uh, missing elements. So typically when we're dealing with metadata collections from uh, NASA or from uh, USGS or from Data One or whatever, <clears throat> we have uh, a number of different levels that we're, that we're trying to uh, uh, evaluate, and, and all those, most of those levels have missing concepts, and then most of the metadata records have missing elements. And so trying to, trying to report or to find, find a way to um, describe uh, what we observe, we, we have a term called signature, and in this case, uh, the signature the signature is just the number of missing elements from a particular dialect for different levels of a recommendation. So if there are three levels for a rec recommendation, a signature has, has three digits in it, actually not, not characters as they're shown, or text characters as they're shown here. But, um, <clears throat> and, and a signature with a, uh, a metadata record with a score of 0, 0, 0, is very is, is as good as it can be. It means that it's missing uh, no dialects uh, from any of the, no, excuse me no elements from any of the levels in a rec recommendation. So metadata improvement is a little bit like golf uh, or metadata evaluation. The way we're doing it, low scores are good, and we do that because different recommendations and different levels and different dialects all have different numbers of things. And when we started doing this, we were uh, high scores were good, um, but the problem was that the, the high scores were different for every different combination of dialect <clears throat> and concept, or dialect and recommendation. So in some cases, the score of six was as well as you could do, and in some cases, it meant that you were missing uh, you know, three elements. So we, we, we reversed our, our concept to, uh, to low scores are good. And, and that's consistent across everything. Okay, so metadata dialects, just to go back and make sure that we understand what this means. Um, in NASA, many of you um, are from, uh, familiar with the common metadata repository, the CMR. Uh, the CMR has um, two, three major dialects, uh, the, the traditional uh, echo and diff dialects. And then the new uh, ISO dialects that we're really trying to transition to as part of the development of the CMR. And then in, uh, in the NASA data collections, we also have uh, dialects that are inside of the files, or granule dialects, like HCF EOS and uh, NetCDF and CF. So uh, and this is not a very different situation than, than other uh, collect large collections of metadata. We're dealing with a lot of different dialects. <clears throat> in the USGS, we looked at uh, collections of metadata included in something called Science Base. I don't know if uh, Sky is here, but uh, Sky was helpful in, in uh, helping us get that uh, metadata. And in the USGS, uh, in Science Base, it's primarily a, a CSTGM or an FGDC um, uh, collection. But it turns we looked at uh, something like 25 different uh, collections of metadata within science base created by different groups in the USGS, and many of them had extended FGDC. We found that many of them had extended FGDC in various ways. So once a, a group in, in an organization creates um, extensions, then it's, it's very similar to um, uh, multiple dialects. And, uh, and, and or multiple versions of a single dialect. Of course, a lot of the federal agencies are dealing with data.gov, which introduces yet another um, uh, challenge. Um, I noticed Sarah on the, on the line, she's done a lot of work with others on, on trying to um, uh, 
fit uh, existing metadata dialects into data.gov. Uh, sometimes it's smooth and sometimes it's not. And of course, uh, as part of Betty, we're also interested in supporting uh, standards from the Open Geospatial Consortium. So those standards, um, CSW is a recommendation, but there's web coverage services, mapping services, feature services, and observation services that are all like metadata dialects. So we're in a world, whether we like it or not, um, and we have been for quite a while, where we have multiple metadata dialects and, um, and we also have multiple recommendations. And when I started this work uh, with, with Kurt Tilmus and others from NASA and uh, Jeff Walter, you know, they said, we want to make a set of recommendations that we can share with our USGS, our USGO partners, um, a set of recommendations for, for metadata that they should have. And I said, well, you know, we really have a lot of recommendations around. And um, making another one is probably not a solution to the problem. <clears throat> so, so we tend, we, we, one of the elements of this work is that we really, we're working in, in a multiple recommendation and dialect world. And we're not, we're super interested in, you know, coming up with yet another set of recommendations or even yet another uh, dialect. Um, we're, we're trying to work with what we've got. So recommendations, uh, this is a couple different recommendations here for data discovery, accessibility, usability, and understanding. Remember that recommendations are associated with use cases. Um, we have a lot of well-known data discovery recommendations because data discovery is an important use case that has been uh, you know, thought about and worked on in metadata land for a long time. As we go to accessibility, most of the recommendations are related to services, uh, service access to data. When we go to understanding, um, the recommendations are less, uh, less um, specific and, and less well known, and, and many of the dialects don't really support uh, much understanding because they focus on discovery. So. <clears throat> We even like to think about the differences between recommendations and capabilities. Most of the, many of the recommendations, as I said earlier, are in discovery land. This is the minimum, particularly this is the mandatory recommendations. This is the mandatory stuff of why it's required the lowest bar. Uh, <laughs> I got a question. I, I guess I can try and answer it. Uh, I made required the lowest bar because, as I said earlier, when we're making recommendations, we don't want to upset those, um, you know, those scientists that are creating data sets, and we don't, certainly don't want to give them very onerous tasks when it comes to sharing their data with others. So we try and make required the smallest number possible. A lot of you know me, and you and you know that that. I refuse to word, use the words minimum and metadata uh, in a single sentence because minimal metadata is, is, uh, it hurts users actually more than it helps them, but that's why required was the lowest bar. Um, anyway, a lot of discovery recommendations, fewer understanding recommendations, <clears throat> but at the same time, many of the dialects we use uh, certainly um, uh, even uh, classic dialects like uh, FGDC, but certainly ISO, have a lot of capabilities that are related to accessibility and understanding. So the capabilities of the dialects are, are much uh, higher or much more complete or much broader, let's say, than many of the recommendations. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the world that we live in is uh, uh, trying to make the improvement, and I I gave a talk a while ago or a poster or something called uh, Getting Off the Discovery Plateau. And um, we're, uh, we're a lot of the metadata that we deal with that was created some time ago is sort of stuck on this plateau of, of discovery content. And what we're trying to do is to help evaluate uh, that, that metadata and then improve it by uh, adding things that are related to understanding. Uh, and accessibility. I was happy to see in the polling question that a number of people were interested in um, 
in understanding, using metadata for understanding, and of course that's, that's the most uh, difficult in some cases and, and the most important. Okay, so recommendations and dialects, the relationships between these things is, are always complex, so the definitions are, you know, a little bit fuzzy, um, but, and, and they develop historically. So, for instance, uh, someone, an organization might create a dialect, and that dialect, uh, many times when people, when organizations create dialects, they come out with some recommendations. Again, in this case, they have three recommendations, and that, that dialect and set of recommendations are sort of designed to work for uh, some community um, that's, that's using that dialect. And then some other community comes along and they create another dialect. And, you know, that dialect um, uh, overlaps uh, the other dialect. There's always overlap uh, between these dialects. That's what sort of dialects are. And then and, and the dialect could also overlap the recommendation. There might be other recommendations made by the group um, that creates the second dialect, and they may overlap as well. And a lot of times, as I sort of implied earlier, these, a lot of these recommendations, a lot of these overlaps happen in the discovery uh, part of the business. And then some other recommendation might come along, a recommendation without a dialect that, that overlaps other things. So there's a lot of uh, um, feedback between these things, or a lot of overlap and a lot of uh, evolution of them. And uh, this is what I said earlier, that you know, we don't, we, we're not suffering from a paucity of, uh, of recommendations. But as I also sort of implied, <clears throat> uh, it's just as the definitions are fuzzy, in our work, what we're doing is, is separating these things and uh, thinking of them differently uh, or, or uh, examining the, the two kinds of things separately. And what's really important about this, I was, I was talking to uh, some friends at Data One, and, and this occurred to me. If we have two different uh, communities that are trying to document their, meta, their data using some, some metadata, and they're, and they're using dialects, and they have different recommendations, there's, there's very, it's very difficult for those communities to communicate with one another because their, you know, their, their recommendations reflect what they think is important in the documentation. And, and by, and, but people that are using another recommendation don't look at those, uh, people that are using another dialect don't look at those recommendations because they're, you know, their recommendations for the XYZ dialect, not for the dialect that I'm using. So by separating these things and thinking about them separately, combining them in different and new ways, we, we facilitate sharing of experiences and, and ideas uh, across community boundaries. And of course, because we're in um, USGEO um, and the other uh, projects that I mentioned, sharing, you know, breaking down those, those metadata silos between different uh, dialects and different recommendations is, is an important goal of our work. Okay, so we have a number of different tools that we're uh, developing and experimenting with, uh, tools for comparing dialects, recommendations, uh, tools for evaluating the, the completeness of uh, metadata records, tools for analyzing that completeness and, and summarizing the results, and then uh, those, you know, graphical, uh, hopefully graphical, useful graphical displays of, of those results. And finally, guidance, um, which is, you know, what people use to improve their results. Okay, so recommendation comparisons, this is one tool uh, we have on the web. Uh, I think there's a URL uh, in this, in this uh, graphic. But in this case, for comparing recommendations, we have a list of all of the, uh, the concepts that are included in, in three different recommendations in this case. Um, and then count the, 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 you know, a very sophisticated technique here. We count up the number of uh, recommendations that, that a certain concept is in. And, and this helps us identify concepts that are important across a variety of recommendations or important across a variety of communities. Obviously, in a lot of situations, we don't have, um, we don't necessarily have resources for making all 
of our metadata perfect. Um, so this kind of thing, if, if an organization is dealing with multiple recommendations, and we almost always are, this helps us identify things that are, that are sort of high impact concepts, things that we should work on making sure we have uh, uh, completed uh, completely so that, that if our metadata happens to get, uh, so, well, so that our metadata can satisfy multiple recommendations. Uh, this is a, a, a screenshot from one version of that tool. In this case, we're looking at catalog services for the web and data site. So the first two columns here, so the, the rows are at our concepts included in these two recommendations. The CSW recommendation has two elements, uh, core queryables and core returnables. So it's a little bit different than some of the others because things can actually overlap. In other words, a concept like title is something that people can query on and also something that gets returned. So in that case, there's overlap between these two parts of this recommendation. Uh, data site, uh, the home of DOIs, is, is a more traditional situation, although there is also a little bit of overlap there where we have uh, the mandatory concepts and the recommended, recommended concepts. <clears throat> and um, comparing these, we find high impact concepts that are actually included across multiple recommendations. And then uh, the next level are, are uh, included across, say, both of the CSW queryables and, and, and returnables. So, this helps us understand um, or helps us quantitatively, you know, have quantitative evidence to help us evaluate uh, what, where we maybe should focus our attention. So dialect comparison is the next tool. Um, same idea, multiple concepts that are in multiple dialects and uh, just simply counting them up. So this could be a comparison between, say, diff uh, and ECHO and ISO, or it could be a comparison between EML and FGDC and ISO, um, or in, in a situation where organizations are thinking about migrating from a legacy uh, dialect to ISO, you know, they can use this tool to see the concepts that are in um, their, their dialect and maybe not in ISO, or in ISO and not in their dialect. Um, yeah, so dialect selection and development decisions. In, um, in, in, as, as we try and decide between dialects, we have to answer questions like this one. Are there important concepts missing from the dialects you're using? And this happens because recommendations evolve, right? We have groups uh, that are working in metadata land now uh, that are bringing new ideas to the table. Uh, and those ideas are, in many cases, uh, helpful for, for our users. So uh, the newer dialects uh, uh, have, in many cases, um, concepts that aren't included in older dialects. And knowing what those are help organizations understand what the benefits are of, of migrating from, from one dialect to another. And then finally, recommendation and dialect comparison. So now we're actually, we have a set, a, a, a recommendation to multiple dialects. And um, same, same idea that I've, I've been going through here. I'll just move on. But, but um, I've got a recommendation like, well, uh, an example of this might be a data site or catalog services for the web. I'll show an example later. Uh, we're interested in supporting catalog services um, for the web. Many organizations are interested in supporting that because it's a, um, uh, it's a very standard uh, uh, recommendation for, um, comes from OGC, and we're trying to support it for services and things like that. And so the question is, depending on what dialect we're using, we may or may not support all of the, uh, the elements in the CSW recommendations, and we should be able to determine what we're not supporting or what we are supporting and uh, in, in the decision process. Yeah, OK. Helps users understand relationships between recommendations and dialects. So here's a, a one example of that, uh, recommendations and legacy dialects. Uh, legacy dialects are just 
in my in this uh, definition di dialects that have been around longer than recommendations. So the data site recommendation is an interesting one. It it it, um, it came about in the last couple of years uh, from uh, the the organization data site that was in, very interested in DOIs. So uh, the CSTGM dialect, of course, has been around since. Um, you know, it's one of those geologic ages like Jurassic or something like that. You know, it's, it's, it's a super classic. It's been around forever. And um, data site recommendation has some concepts that aren't included in uh, the CSDGM um, dialect. So if you're using CSDGM and you're interested in um, uh, supporting data site, you may need to extend your uh, CSTGM or something like that. You, may, you, you know, you can decide what the uh, what you need to do. This is the gap that we're trying to identify. Uh, in the NASA case, of course, we have the same thing. In this case, we have echo and diff. Uh, again, two uh, classic uh, dialects that have been around for quite a while, and uh, also ISO, uh, which is a, a newer dialect. And in this case, we are looking at the uh, catalog services for the web recommendation. And DIFF and ECHO, uh, let's see, the catalog services for the red web is this dash line that actually you can't see because it, it just so happens that the ISO dialect is not missing any concepts from CSW. Uh, DIFF and ECHO are, are missing uh, a, few, um, di a, a few concepts. And this is uh, core queryables, core returnables, and additional queryables. So it's important this kind of analysis comes up, is, is, is possible because of the separation that I mentioned earlier between recommendations and dialects. And it's really designed to help uh, organizations uh, understand decisions. Because if, you're, if, you're, if you've got, I mean, everybody has um, systems uh, that support their existing uh, dialects. And if they want to use, support a new recommendation, and elements of that recommendation are not supported by their current dialects, that means they need to evolve those systems. Uh, they may need to, to change editors. They may need to have different kinds of training, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so understanding, um, understanding these differences is an important part of a strategic uh, decision, and you might decide to just do as well as you can um, in the dialect that you've got. And that's, that's the first part of what we're doing. Um, we're evaluating metadata, and I'll show you this in a minute, in, in native dialects. And, and, and once we identify these gaps, we sort of move on to, uh, to look at the actual metadata. Yeah, another thing, CMR is, is sort of broader. Uh, the, the common metadata repository, the goal is to be broader than GIF and ECHO and understanding uh, you know, sort of the details of that increased broadness is, is what one of the things we're trying to support here. So characterizing collection completeness. Now, this is going to be like a really nasty, very busy slide, but I'm going to go through it a little bit slowly. And hopefully, um, all you need to worry about is differences in colors. On the y-axis here are metadata records. So each row, this is a spreadsheet obviously, each row in this spreadsheet is a metadata record. Each column in this spreadsheet is an element. So some element of a recommendation and, and, and looking for those elements in multiple records. Uh, the first thing that we see that we want to say is that if it's green, of course, green is good. So if, if, if a cell is green, it means that that record includes the element that's in that column. Green is good, always. Uh, there are some, some elements where the, the white line, the miss, they're missing from all of the records. So this is what elements look like if they're missing from the dialect. They're an element from a recommendation that's just not in any of the metadata. So in this case, there, there's, there's a few of those around. And then there's also these little blocks of white. Here's one. Here's the, the, the top of one. Here's one. So what these actually are are groups of records. Remember, records are on the, on the, on the rows. 
there are groups of records that are missing some concept. Uh, so whatever concept this is, it's missing from whatever five or six records. Whatever concepts these are, they're missing from five or six records over here. But the sort of interesting thing is that when you look at these collections, they tend to divide themselves into groups. And um, this is a little bit unexpected, and of course it's not true all the time, but typically there's, a, there's a, a large subset of records that are missing the same things. And you know, when you think about how these metadata records get created, they get created by different people, maybe different times, different programs. So they get, in many cases, created in groups in certain ways. So maybe it's not actually that surprising that, that groups are missing similar things. Uh, there's the first group. Here's the second group, which is missing this guy over here. Um, and then uh, you know, other groups. So when we look at a collection, we're usually looking at hundreds or thousands of metadata records at one time. Uh, so we get a lot of rows in these spreadsheets. And our goal is to divide them up into groups, because obviously, if you identify a group of 20 records that, that are missing the same thing, then you can improve those records by adding you know, one concept or one element to those records. So when we look at diff uh, directory interchange records, now we're looking at the results of that analysis. This was uh, 400 and some uh, diff records from climate data, uh, NASA data, uh, as, which is part of the Climate Data Initiative. So the y-axis, sorry, the x-axis is the number of records going from 0 to 250. And um, the y-axis is the signature that I mentioned earlier. So notice 0, 0 is a good score. That's why 0, 0 is on top. And uh, progress is made by uh, going, uh, removing, you know, filling in missing elements. And the, the nice thing about this uh, set is that half of the records, 230 out of 450 or so, are already at dialect max. So their, their score is 0, 0. So they're doing as well as they can do. Um, and this is uh, CSW. So what's important about these quantitative evaluations is that we figure out, we identify good examples. And in the diff case, we've got a bunch of good examples. And then these, we've got 19 records that are missing one thing, 46 records that are missing two things. And it turns out that the things that they're miss missing are actually pretty pretty fairly simple things that we can probably uh, address. And, and it could be that there are, that they're missing these things for a reason, but we know uh, what they're missing and, and how big of a task is it is it might be to fix it. In ECHO, it's a little bit different picture. Again, signatures on the y-axis, good scores are at the top, progress going up. In this case, we're dealing with 700 and some records. And, and the good news here is that the largest group of 370 records, or about half, is only missing three elements. There are also nine records in this case that are, are complete. And again, those can be good examples for all these, other, uh, all these other records. Again, the things that we're missing are, are, um, are not uh, rocket science, even though the data is. These are things that we should be able to address and, and, and fix. So this is what we, how we um, share our results. Um, a couple other things I wanted to touch on really briefly. This is another view. In this case, we're looking at additional attributes that are uh, extensions in metadata. And the echo, we're looking at echo metadata here. And it has a very nice, very complete model for describing additional attributes. These attributes are not described in the echo standard. So, um, and they're in climate, this is climate uh, data initiative records. So people that are using this metadata can only use the information that's in the metadata to, to understand what this, these additional attributes are. And for that to work, um, you would need all this information. So for uh, whatever set this is, you, would, you want a horizontal line going across saying all of these elements are complete. In this case, we can see different uh, DACs that are um, uh, using additional attributes. And we see that the numbers 
uh, for name and description of data type are the same. So it means all of their additional attributes have that information, name and description and, and data type. That's great. Um, but they're missing these things, accuracy and, and range and units that also might come in important so, or might be important for users. So um, instead of having a big recommendation and looking at hundreds of records, in this case, we're just, we have a very small, what we call a quick evaluation that can address a very tight, sort of a hackathon kind of a, an example. Um, we've got reports on a couple of these in the Earth Data Wiki. One is the one I just mentioned. This is a NASA Wiki. Um, uh, additional attributes. And we also have one on people and organizations in um, the Common Metadata Repository. So this is sort of the beginning of, of agency-specific um, uh, results that are on, uh, you know, a NASA, um, these are NASA results that are on, uh, on a NASA wiki. They're also, the URLs are down here. They're also available. I think both of these pages are publicly open. So this is, this is sort of a, a, a result, and as, we, as these records improve over time, um, these, uh, these results will improve over time. Um, we also have the guidance pages. Our guidance pages uh, are, are not on an organization-specific um, uh, site. They're on the ESIP wiki, uh, the Earth Science Information Partnership, and this is uh, the URL for this. We have quite a, a, a bunch of pages there. Some of these are similar to pages that were on the, on the uh, NOAA wiki. Um, for 19115, and some of these are, are legacy dialects and also 19115, and the new, the revision, dash one. We have uh, dialect description, so in this case, documenting browse graphics in a number of different dialects. Um, the idea there is that uh, if, if, if you're using a particular dialect, you can understand how to do this. And then we also have crosswalks between dialects. So if you're, if, you're, if you're familiar with CSCGM and you want to know what something looks like in, in ISO, you can look at these crosswalks. So uh, again, these are on the ESIP wiki. And of course, anybody, anybody that's uh, listening to this um, presentation can have an account on the ESIP wiki, contribute their uh, examples and their experiences to these pages. Uh, we're using the ESIP wiki because it's really a, a US, I mean, it's really a a broadly uh, available tool that the whole community and or all the communities that we're dealing with can use. And that is the last slide. Sorry, I went just a little bit over maybe. But I guess we'll return now to Jennifer for possible questions. OK, thank you, Ted. Thanks, everybody. So what we're actually going to do next, we do have a uh, final set of polling questions, which we would appreciate your feedback on. Generally, I try to give these questions a couple of minutes or so. Um, from there, uh, so at about you know, um, 2.50, we'll move along to the Q&A period. And I do have uh, several questions already that have been received. And so depending on the volume of questions that are received, we can extend the Q&A to 3.15 p.m. for those of you who are able to stay on the line. Um, and if you're not able to stay on the line, you should know that, again, this webinar is being recorded. Um, the Q&A log is persistent feature uh, when listening to the webinar at a later date. And so you would be able to actually review that information later or certainly follow up with our speaker offline if need be. Um, and I'm always available. If you need to email me, I can forward any questions to Ted. All right, so let's give these a couple of minutes, and then we'll transition to the Q&A. All right, thanks, everybody.
Okay, everybody, I'm going to give this just a couple more seconds, and then we will transition to the Q&A. Okay, we're going to transition now to our question and answer period. And um, just a quick point before we do so. Uh, the webinar, again, will be posted to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel. If you search for NASA Earth Data, it will also be posted to our online catalog, which you can find by going to the URL at the bottom of the slide to your left, the, the tinyurl.com. There we do have archived all webinars. Um, from the last three years, I believe dating back to May of uh, 2013, All right? So our first question today, I need to um, move up here, bear with me for a moment. Okay, does the score take into account anything other than missing elements, for example, incorrect elements? Um. Right now, the, uh, the score does not take into account um, uh, anything other than the existence of the element. <clears throat> um, when we were doing similar things at NOAA, we talked about finding um, elements that said NA or something like that and, and um, subtra you know, subtracting uh, numbers from scores for those. Um, I think there's a lot of interest, um, or I'm working with, um, Matt Jones and, and uh, from NCs and, and Sky Bristol from USGS. There's a lot of interest in, in going beyond just measuring completeness. And uh, one obvious step is consistency that we're also not met with. We've got some tools for looking at. But in terms of real quality of the metadata, you know, how, how good the metadata is, we really need to have um, uh, you know what OAIS called designated community representatives who who tell us whether the, the metadata is working for them. But if people have ideas for you know other approaches to that, um, it's definitely something that we're thinking about. Right now, we're starting with the simple stuff. Okay, thank you, Ted. And I wanted to get back to a comment and a question that was addressed a bit earlier, and that was the comment regarding slide number eight. And the, and the comment was, like more of an explanation of slide eight, where the inclination is that required is the lowest bar. However, um, the same, so you had addressed that, Ted, but the same participant um, indicated that required was the highest bar in the slide. Yeah. Well, you know, we all try and develop analogies for helping explain ideas. And uh, as I said, this is my first shot at the, uh, the playground bar analogy. And um, <clears throat> so comments for how I might improve it, you know, play, playground uh, uh, chin-up bar version 2.0 are certainly welcome. OK, Ted. Thank you. So the <laughs> next comment. And Okay. I don't know if required should be the highest or the lowest. I thought I made a good argument for it being the lowest, but who knows. All right. Thanks, Ted. So the next question um, and comment is, I noticed that CF is not listed here, but it's in wide use in NASA user communities and NOAA. Is there a story here? Um, thanks, James. Um, CF. CF is a is a use uh, recommendation, and um, most of so it's use, it's more important or it's typically more important in granules, uh, and it's used of course in in, in a lot of granules. Um, we're looking at collection records here, um, so applying CF is a little bit a little bit different, um, but. Uh, you know, CF and, and um, of course, ACDD is the the younger uh, the younger sibling of CF, the sort of discovery part of the of the NetCDF family. Um, we're pretty familiar with that. So CF, uh, you know, I think we have the machinery to do CF. I'd have to sort of look and see how much we've got it in there, um, but it, it's not excluded for a reason um, uh, for any you know specific. Uh, reason really at this point. It's just something we haven't haven't gotten to. But if, if a group, 
for instance, had a set of metadata um, and they were interested in supporting CF, um, you know, that would be something that would be interesting to do. And we could do that with tools like NCISO, uh, maybe, uh, although that was really discovery oriented. Yeah, so CF, I agree, it, CF is important. Okay, thank you, Ted. The next uh, combination and comment slash question is uh, from Byron. Data discovery is an important use of metadata. Are there tools within recommendations to refine results when there is a large number of results? Um, I, these, I mean, I agree that data discovery is, is important. Um, I think that tools for refining results, um, uh, I, I think unless I misunderstand you, Brian, would be things that are in like search engines, like Reverb or GCMD. Um, and uh, you know, here the the question that James asked is important. You could discover a bunch of data sets, and then you could say which of these are CF compliant, uh, and um, or could we somehow measure the CF compliance as part of the sort of um, uh, you know the next step in refining a set of search results? Of course, there's a group um, in ESDSWG, the Earth Science Data Systems Working Group, that's working on relevancy. And I, I think the question you asked, Byron, would be sort of interesting. Uh, what role does metadata completeness have in, um, in, in, in determining maybe not relevancy results, but usability results? And, and that's a good place where CF might come in. I've got, I've got CF compliant tools. I've got 100 data sets. I'm interested in finding ones that are compliant with my tools. And of course, HCF EGOS is in, in NASA land uh, an equally important set of, of, uh, of requirements or recommendations that would also support uh, that kind of usability stuff. Okay. I, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Is Byron still here at the bottom somewhere? He was thinking of something like facets, which can be part of the search engine. Should it be part yeah. of the recommendation? And yes, I should... great. Oh, um, one, one thing about facets, um, facets are very um, important um, and, um, and, and sort of a new thing, sort of uh, uh, an exploring thing rather than a browsing thing. That's where consistency um, really uh, comes to the forefront, because if you've got facets <clears throat> that are defined on fields that are uh, inconsistent, then you've got problems because you have multiple uh, representations of the same thing. So um, yeah, facets, and that's really that's consistency more than com completeness, although completeness is also important, but consistency is the important thing there. OK, great. Thank you, Ted. The next question is, who will be scoring the various dialects? Will USGO entities be able to assign dialect scores based on their recommendations, similar to NASA TRLs, or will an independent entity like ESIP score similar to how it already does with the ESIP TRL testbed. So who will be scoring uh, the various dialects? That, that question seems to be asking about a fairly detailed prediction about the future. <laughs> I'm not, you know, my, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I don't really know what the answer is, but I think it's probably important. I mean, I think all of the, um, Suggestions that the trip made are important there. Um, you know, I think evaluate early and evaluate often. Um, I think is is uh, is critical here. The way we develop these tools at NOAA, people that were using things like oxygen um, uh, or other more you know sophisticated XML editors could could run evaluations on their desktops before they shared um, their metadata. And at the same time, um, you know, they could also evaluate metadata that, that was already um, in, a, in a repository somewhere. You know, so, so right now, I mean, my sort of general feeling would be to answer your question. Um, I, I would just assume not eliminate any possibilities. Um, you know, and the other thing is often, right? Evaluate early, evaluate often. Many of these metadata records are, are evolving as a function of time. So 
um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the group at NGDC um, developed some, some capabilities for tracking changes as a function of time. That's another important thing. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Ted. So the next question is, are the various UMMXs considered to be recommendations? Yes. Um, the UMMXs are profiles of the unified metadata model, things like metadata for uh, collections or services or um, uh, uh, granules. And, and within those, the documents that describe those, there are required fields and optional fields. So what we're doing right now is for the UMM common, which are uh, fields that are, go across all of the all of the profiles or all of the X's, we have the required and optional fields. So there's there's uh, each UMM X has really two uh, recommendations in, in our nomenclature. And we're doing the common separately so that we can evaluate any, any UMMX against the common plus uh, in addition to the, the X specific elements, sort of, if that makes sense, Kathleen. Um, okay. All right. Thank you, Ted. The next question is, does missing or the white indicate metadata missing from, from the category of required elements only? Um, that depends on which of the which, which level in a recommendation you're testing for. So if we're testing for data site, for instance, we have the mandatory and then the recommendation levels, and we, we identify elements that are missing at both of those levels. So, um, you know, it depends, uh, depends on which recommendation you're looking at. Okay, thanks, Ted. Our next question is, is there a Betty-endorsed dialect for data set quality fag, flags, excuse me, such as for enabling interpretation and utilization by the end user? Um, well, uh, you know, this is, this is a trick question coming from David Maroney um, because he knows that my answer is Ted's endorsed dialect is ISO 19157. I, I think that 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 uh, that's a that's a um, that that dialect is really the most complete one that we have with respect to data quality. Um, much more complete than sort of the traditional picture where data quality is a text string, um, you know, or a block of text. Uh, the 19157 uh, dialect is is much more complete and. Um, and really, I think, diverse enough to support the needs that, that we have. Uh, I don't know if that, I mean, Betty is not really endorsing dialects. We're trying to uh, provide tools for quantitative uh, comparisons of dialects uh, and, and also comparisons with respect to certain recommendations. OK, fantastic. Thank you. Our next question is, is there guidance on dialects or elements between collections parentheses, full metadata and granules consisting the order of magnitude difference and homogeneity of granules within a collection resulting in redundancy. <laughs> okay, Martin, I'm trying to figure out this question. Um, in, uh, in the UMM case that we were talking about a minute ago, um, there is a set of recommendations for collections and then a different set of recommendations for granules. Um, and I, by order of magnitude difference, I don't know if you're talking about the number of granules. Um, you know, we have in, in, in ECHO, for instance, we have some collections that have millions uh, of granules. Um, and, uh, and we haven't really started looking at heterogeneity across those granule collections. You know, it's sort of interesting to think about how metadata for a particular product that has lots of granules, how that metadata might change as a function of time in terms of completeness. Um, I'm not sure that I'm really answering your question. I'm not sure that I understand it completely. But in that redundant. vein, I should uh, make this note to everybody that Ted will be receiving the Q&A log 
And so certainly he can follow up, follow up directly with, with any of you um, for further discussion if need be. Um, our next question moving on here is, how about biodiversity metadata such as Darwin Core, widely used by GBIF and OBIS, IUS, et cetera? I'm not sure if I pronounced those acronyms correctly, so uh, mm -hmm. hopefully. Uh, Darwin Core is a, um, uh, a dialect that's used um, in, in a number of groups um, like GBIF and OBIS. Um, we are, we've got a little bit of Darwin Core metadata in some of the um, uh, Data One uh, collections that we're looking at. Um, it's sort of a small amount of Darwin Core. Most uh, Data One collections are either in an EML or um, some version of FGDC, but there is a little bit of Darwin Core there. Um, and, you know, it's generally, um, it's sort of like Dublin Core, obviously. It's, it's, it's a parent. It's sort of a lightweight um, discovery uh, dialect, a little bit like data site with um, taxonomic information thrown in. Um, so it's, it's, it's a dialect that we've got some samples of. If, if you have uh, you know, collections in, in Darwin Core that you're interested in taking a look at, uh, we'd be happy to do that, but it's, it's one that we haven't gotten to yet. Okay, thank you, Ted. Our next question is, for the crosswalks, are you using existing ones or building new ones? Can you expand upon this? Um, the, uh, I mean, if there are existing crosswalks, we've, we've um, tried to uh, you know, use them in evaluating uh, whether or not we've got the right, um, you know, whether or not our crosswalks are right. Our crosswalks are, are also a little bit at the, in, in general, um, at the, con the conceptual level, so they're, they're a little bit fuzzier. Um, I, I mentioned the crosswalk that, that Noah has been working on, the data.gov. It was a very detailed and, and um, uh, you know, a crosswalk with a bunch of conditions and, and things, and we're not, we're, we're sort of <clears throat> more at a 50,000 foot level than a, than a, a 3,000 foot level um, or a three foot level. At the same time, we're also working on making transforms uh, between things like ECHO and um, ISO or uh, I saw Jackie was on the, in the meeting, the transform between uh, FCSDGM and ISO. In those cases, you know, we get pretty detailed um, uh, and, and more detailed than we generally are in our crosswalks. But the, the crosswalks, as I mentioned, our goal is to have them all on the um, uh, ESIP website so they're publicly available. And um, you know we're always happy to uh, have comments or discussions or improvements um, uh, in those crosswalks from from the communities as well. Okay, thank you, Ted. The next question: Are you working with, or do you plan to work with, software organizations, for example, Esri Excellus, to help determine data usability requirements or recommendations? Um, Shannon, thank you for that great question. Uh, two lines down from you is Martin um, from Esri, and he and I and, and uh, Christine and others at, at Esri have been talking about integration of, of uh, evaluations into uh, GeoPortal. Um, uh, we would, we, I have nothing, I'm, I'm very happy to, to work with software organizations. Um, uh, right now we have no, uh, you know, we have no ongoing projects and, and no sort of proposals in the works. Um, but if you happen to be at a software organization and are interested in, in doing something, um, that would be great. I'd be interested in talking about it. Okay. I think that's, you know, a tool like, I mean, you know, obviously any tool that is used in, um, for a lot of different metadata collections you know, having an evaluation, um, I think, would be be interesting. And you know, we did that in we did that quite a bit in NOAA with threads and MC ISO, where we were evaluating thousands of uh, of granules. Um, 
in in tools, sort of. <laughs> okay, sorry, Jennifer. Oh no, that's okay. Thank you, Ted. So, are there any further questions? We are getting close to the end of the extended uh, Q and A period, and certainly, um, you know, again, Martin, Ted will be able to follow up with you offline on on some of your um, points yeah. for clarification. Are there any additional questions within the last four minutes or so here? I would like to take this opportunity to really thank all of you for the great questions and for your participation today. Um, again, within a couple of days, I should have this posted online, both to the online catalog, as noted on the slide to the left, and then also to our NASA Earth Data uh, YouTube channel. And if you're interested in downloading the presentation, at the bottom of your screen on the right-hand side, there is a file sharing pod. If you left-click on either one of those two files, the agenda has been uploaded as well as the PowerPoint. Uh, you'll be prompted then with an option to download those files should you be interested. And the way that this will work is that um, if there are no further questions, we will log off from the telecon. However, I will leave the meeting room with the virtual space open. Uh, for an additional 10 minutes for those of you interested in downloading the presentation. All right, so let me uh, scroll through here. I don't see anything at this moment. All right, last call for questions. At least within this format. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Ted. Uh, at this point, everybody, uh, there are no further questions. We will go ahead and log off from the telecon. Again, I will leave the meeting room open. So certainly, if you have a question, feel free to type that in. And uh, if Ted is able to stay online for an additional 10 minutes, he could probably type in a, an answer as well. All right, so thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, Jennifer. It was wonderful. You're quite welcome. All right, bye-bye, everybody.